All right, so this will be the first video um, in a series of videos that we're going to go through uh, to to teach um, calculus one to begin with, and the the goal is to get through the calculus sequence all the way through calculus three. Um, and so we're actually going through um, James Stewart's uh, calculus book, so the sixth edition. And uh, so we'll follow, so you can see the section 1.1, we're going to follow the sections, um, do uh, probably all of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them. Um, there, there's a couple I know in the, at least one in the first chapter that we'll probably skip. And then we'll, we'll see as we go along, we may, there may be others that we, that we skip over. We'll just, we'll just see, but we'll do most of them. Um, and we'll cover all of the relevant things to make sure that uh, all the all the topics that are needed to learn calculus are covered. So um, hopefully this will prepare you well. Uh, so the first idea that we're talking about is the idea of a function. Uh, most most you know algebra classes cover functions, pre-calculus covered functions. Uh, you definitely see functions if you take trig. Um, and really the study of calculus is the study of functions. And so we, we need this as the uh, foundation. Um, so this first section probably would be a lot of review, but, but the better the foundation you have now, the easier the later stuff will be. Um, so you want to make sure you make sure you understand this pretty well. Uh, so the first example here, the area A of a circle depends on the radius of the circle. So of course the formula that we're familiar with, A equals pi r squared, all this is saying is that given a radius, we can find the area of the circle. Um, it doesn't depend on anything else. And then likewise, the human population of the world, P depends on time T. Um, so for any given year, and maybe to be more specific, we should say any moment in time. Um, so for each value of t and i say yeah moment in time because if you say the year you know obviously the population on january 1st is going to be different than the population on december 31st you know 365 days later um but at any particular moment in time there is an exact population uh and that is the population so it's not going to be you know at this moment in time it's not seven billion and 8 billion at the same time. So um, so that's the idea of the function. So for each value of t, um, there is a corresponding value of p. Um, and so for that value of t, that is the unique value of p. Um, and it doesn't mean um, that the population couldn't be the same at two different times, but for one particular time, you're not going to have two different values of the population. Um, so let's look at this um, kind of in a diagram here with uh, the, the machine diagram. So we have the input X going into the function F, and then it spits out an output. So that's the idea of the function. You, you give it an input and you're guaranteed to get an out the the predicted output out of it. Um, and it's, you know, if you put the X in today, you have a particular value of X in today, you get a particular output and you put the same value of X in later and you get the same output. So you're not going to get two different outputs for the same input. So a function, we want to define this. A function is a rule. That assigns each element in a set A, we'll just call the set A, to um, exactly one element in another set B. Um, so exactly one element, that's that's kind of the important part. Uh, this element, whatever element from this first set A can only go to one element in B. So A, the set, an element in set A cannot go to two or more elements. Uh, it has to go to exactly one. Uh, so we have the domain. So the domain is the set 
of all valid elements from A, or all valid inputs, we could say, then the range is the set of all corresponding elements. from B. Um, so all of, so you put an, an X in and you get an output that would that output would come in at, to the range. Uh, it would be part of the range. So X or whatever your input variable is, um, it, it, you know it could be anything. So here here in this example it was labeled T uh, in the circle the input was labeled R, but whatever whatever it is. So X is, the independent variable or whatever your input variable is, that's called the independent variable. And then uh, f of x, or in this case, p of t, so the function was called p for population, or f of x generally, uh, that's the most common one, is the dependent variable. And so all that means is uh, given a particular uh, you can choose your input. In other words, you can choose your input and then your output is dictated by the input that you chose. So um, probably probably familiar stuff, but it's good to, good to kind of review this again. Um, so another way to picture a function is the arrow diagram. So we have our set of inputs over here. And we have our set of outputs over here. And so it, pick, pick any value in here. Um, and you, there's no limit to how many you could have. Um, and you will uh, put it into the function and then you get an output over here. And notice we don't have uh, two or two arrows coming from the same input. That would, if you had this, uh, that would make that into not being a function anymore. Um, so another thing that we'll work with a lot in calculus um, is the idea of graphs. And I know you've worked with graphs before. We're going to do a lot, a lot in this class. Um, calculus one especially has a lot, a lot of work with graphs. So if you're not if you're not good with graphs, um, by the end of calculus one, you will be very good with graphs, um, or at least at least more comfortable. And so. Um, you can see the the x here is the input, and then you plug that into the function, and then the height gives you the output. And so we can determine the domain and the range. So in this case, the domain starts here and then goes here. The domain would be whatever these values of x are. And then the range starts with the bottom, um, wherever the bottom is. And then it doesn't go to that point, it goes to wherever the top is. So the range is from, from that point down to that point or from here to here. Um, so let's uh, look at an example here. So number one, oops. Number one, the graph of a function is shown below. Find the values of f of one and f of five. So this is our x. So x is always in the parentheses. So given that value of x, um, what would the corresponding value of y be? And so all we do um, is figure out, here's the, the x equals 1. What is the value of y? So we're going basically measuring that. And so 1, 2, 3. So f of 1 is 3. And now uh, there's 2, 3, 4, five so f of five what is the y value when x is five so we come down to right there and we'll we'll say that that is negative one um and so that's how we that's how you you know get the value of a function from a graph um any of them you know well maybe not any of them but typically it's you know if you're just looking at the graph you need you need kind of a, you know it's, it's going to be hard to figure out exactly what what that value is uh, there. Um, but that's the idea. Whatever that value is, that's the value of f of three point whatever. Um, so now how do we find the domain? So for the domain, just start at the left. And so the left va x value is zero. And uh, we're going to use brackets. So if you recall, bracket means that we are including that number. Um, we'll see different um, 
examples where maybe we include that number, maybe we don't. So, um, but obviously the value at zero is there. So um, it is there. And then go all the way to the right. And then what is that uh, X value there? So five, six, seven. So the domain is from zero to seven and we are including both. So if you recall, uh, the brackets mean we include includes endpoints. Parentheses means you would not include the endpoint. So if we put parentheses uh, by the zero, that would mean that you go all the way up to zero, but you don't quite get to zero. And then the range. Uh, for the range, we don't start at the left. So for the range, we actually start wherever the bottom of the graph is. So the bottom looks like it's about right there. And so that would be negative two. And we're going to include that. Negative two, and then where is the top of the graph? The top of the graph would be right there. So one, two, three, four. So negative two to four. Okay, so we'll work with um, a lot of a lot of domain and range. Uh, if you're not if you're not comfortable with domain and range yet, uh, you want to make sure that you do get comfortable with that. Um, all right, so sketch the graph and find the domain and range of each function. So this should be um, a little bit of a review. So this is just a linear function, and then we have a quadratic function. So no, nothing too complex here. Um, if you don't know how to graph something, uh, especially with a basic function like this, we're going to get into much more complex functions to graph where uh, this would be a little bit more difficult but you could you could still use this method if you needed to um although we're going to learn plenty of tricks to avoid having to do this but if you need to you can always create a table of values and so x is the input and i won't do this completely but you could just pick some x values plug these in for your x and then see what your y is so if x is negative one y is going to be negative 3. So 2 times negative 1, negative 2, and then negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And then uh, plug in 0 for x, we get negative 1, plug in 1 for x, and we get 1. So now these are ordered pairs, and we can plot the ordered pairs. But, um, of course, this is a linear function. You, you've you seen linear functions since Algebra 1. Um, and so all we need to do really is get the y-intercept, which is negative 1. And the slope is 2, so we're going to go up 2 and then over 1. And so there is one point, there is another point, and so there is our linear graph. Um, so, I mean, I did say you could create a table for any of these, but that, that should be the last, uh, you know, the last thing that you would try. Um, and if you have to do that, especially on one that you're, you should be familiar with, like you should be familiar with linear functions, you should be familiar with quadratics, um, you should be familiar with um, trig functions and exponentials, a lot of these. And we'll, we'll, we'll go through these as we, as we move through these first few sections, but um, you, you want to get to where you can, you can graph these basic functions pretty easily. Uh, so what's the domain? The domain of all linear functions is going to be negative infinity to infinity. And then the range also is negative infinity to infinity. And so the way you want to think about domain uh, in cases like this is any, any input x that you plug in, you're going to multiply it by 2. So are there any real numbers that you could, that you're not allowed to multiply by 2? Um, so for instance, if I, you know, 2 times 2 is 4, 10 times 2 is 20, negative 5 times 2 is negative 10. Um, so any number, you know, you could plug in fractions, you could plug in square roots, you could plug in 0. Um, any number that you plug in for x, you can multiply by 2. And then you can take that number, the product, and subtract 1, and you're still going to be good. Um, so that's one way to think about domain um, that will be helpful as we as we move along, I think. Um, so that's one way to think of domain. And then range. Um, range, you kind of have to think about the graph. Um, but you could also, if you, if you uh, put any number on this side, so you put 5, 
could you solve that equation? Or you put seven, could you solve that equation? Or you put any other number, could you solve the equation? And of course you could. Um, so that'll give you some X that could give you that Y. Um, so there are no restrictions on the linear functions. But you, you know, aside from all that, you can just remember that the domain and range of all linear functions is all real numbers. Um, all right, so we have x squared, y equals x squared. Um, we'll go too much into this, but hopefully you remember that a parabola looks like that. We are centered at the origin. So the domain here is um, all real numbers again. The domain of all quadratic functions. And in fact, this is a polynomial, which we'll talk about polynomial some. Um, the domain of all polynomials is all real numbers. And then the range is not all real numbers. So to find the range, now that we have the graph, where is the bottom? What's the y value of the bottom? Zero. And then the arrows indicate that we're going to keep going increasing without bound. So the range is zero to infinity. And of course, um, you might remember from previous math classes, we always keep parentheses around infinity. So you never put a bracket with uh, positive or negative infinity. All right, uh, moving along to number three, we have um, f of x equals 2x squared minus 5x plus 1. Uh, h is not equal to zero, and we want to evaluate this. This is actually called the difference quotient. And we're going to be, uh, once we get to chapter two, we're going to see this quite a bit. So um, this, is, this is kind of a starting foundation of um, what we're going to be doing in this first part of calculus. So um, what is this? What is this formula here? Um, of course, f, f of x, f of a, f of a plus h, f of whatever is in the parentheses doesn't matter. Uh, that is representing y. Now, if you if you can imagine, um, that is a difference of two y values. And then if you recall, um, how do you find the slope? So you find the slope of a line by getting the change in y and then dividing it by the change in x. So what is the change in x? The change in x would be a plus h minus a. And then of course, a's will cancel out. And so we have f of a plus h minus f of a. So this is this is a slope formula. Um, and so what this what this is measuring is this this is a curve. So this is not a linear function. So um, I don't know off the top of my head where exactly this would be, but it you know might look something like that. And so if we have some point, wherever that point is, um, and we move, so the slope is always changing on this curve. So a nonlinear function, the slope is always changing. And so if we move from here, and we'll kind of go up a little bit farther than maybe this is wanting to illustrate, what is the slope of that line? So there is our a, there is our a plus h. So what is the slope of that line? That is what this tells you. Um, and then the idea is we're going to take, we're going to shrink that h down and we're going to bring this point closer and closer. And then we're going to figure out what the slope is at that point A, what the slope of the tangent line is. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we're working towards. But first thing we need uh, before we get to all that, which is later in the course, is we need to be able to just evaluate this. Um, and I think most algebra classes will do this at some point. Um, it's kind of one of those things that you do at the end of a section. And so maybe you don't remember, um, you, you know, it's one of those things that if you don't get it, it's not going to kill you on the test. But in this class, um, you, you need to make sure that you get it. All right. So uh, f of a, of course, is going to be 2 a squared minus 5a plus 1. So whatever is in the parentheses, just plug in for the x. So we're just replacing the x with an a. All right, f of a plus h. Now this is where students seem to have a little bit of trouble getting used to this. So we're just, we're just whatever is in the parentheses, you plug in for the x. So plug in x, plug in a plus h for the x. So 2 times a plus h squared minus 5 times a plus h and then plus one. And so let's, uh, well, we'll simplify this in a minute. So now we have uh, all the parts here. So f of a plus h. 
minus f of a over h. And so f of a plus h, we have 2a plus h squared minus 5a plus h plus 1. And then we're going to subtract f of a. So 2a squared minus 5a plus 1. And that is all over h. So now it's just a matter of simplifying this. Um, and one of the things I've noticed teaching calculus uh, is most people seem to get the calculus part of this. Um, they seem to learn the rules that you need to learn for the most part, but then they mess up on the algebra. So this, this is just straight algebra. We're just simplifying uh, basic algebraic uh, expression. So 2 times a plus h squared. I'm going to do this all in one motion here. Uh, actually, I'm going to do that. I don't need the parentheses. So a plus h squared and then times 2. So we get 2a squared plus 4ah plus 2h uh, squared. Let me redo that. 2h squared. Distribute 5. So we get 5a minus 5h plus 1, and then distribute that negative, so minus 2a squared plus 5a minus 1, and then this is all over h. So what happens here is any of the terms that do not have an h in this numerator will cancel out. So the 2a squared cancels out, 5a cancels out, and then the 1 cancels out. And so we're just left with, um, hopefully I can scroll this, nope. You gotta be careful. All right. Uh, so we have 4ah plus 2h squared minus 5h, and then all over h. Um, so if we were in algebra class, I would factor out the h on top. Uh, if you're in a calculus class, I should be able to do this without you uh, freaking out too much. But we're going to cancel the h there. This h is going to go into each of these terms. So the, that h is gone. The square is gone, that h is gone, cancels with the denominator. So we have 4a plus 2h minus 5, and that is our difference quotient. Um, so you you for sure want to be, be able to do this um, pretty easily, pretty quickly. Um, we will be using this difference quotient uh, fairly regularly for the first part of this class, F3 Chapter 2. Um, you, you will see this a lot, not so much in chapter one, but once we get to chapter two, you're going to see this a lot. So this is something that you'll want to practice um, and be able to do, do pretty easily. Um, the algebra is very basic, but the, the more complex the function is, the, the more likely, you know, the more chances you had to make mistakes. So um, you, want to, you want to know things like the terms without an H are going to cancel, likely. Um, things like that and then um if you if you need to do this step where you factor out the h that's fine but um you might want to get to where you don't need to do that you can you can just kind of cancel it out all right so uh next representations of functions so we have four representations that we have we kind of talked about all these so far i think so we have verbally where uh we just have a uh, written out description in words uh we have numerically where we have a table. So we did see one like that, table of values. Uh, we have visually, which would be a graph. And then we have algebraically. Algebraically, where we have a formula or more like an equation. So like what we just saw in the last example. All right, so those are four different ways. Uh, we, we've seen them all already, so we won't spend too much time on that. Uh, number four, when you turn on a hot water faucet, the temperature T of the water depends on how long the water has been running. Draw a rough graph of T as a function of time, lowercase t, that has lapsed since the faucet uh, was turned on. So, Let's draw x and y axis, but this will be uh, time, and then this one will be the temperature. 
And so, yeah, there's not, there's not one right answer to this, I guess. Um, but you can imagine if you turn on hot water faucet, it starts out at whatever temperature, room temperature, presumably. Uh, and then it's on the hot water, so it's going to heat up pretty quick, hopefully. And then it's going to hit its maximum temperature. So you have some, some uh, limit on that. And then it's going to level off. And we're just going to assume you keep it running, keep it running, keep it running. Um, and then if you ever take a shower for long enough, eventually the hot water runs out. And so then it starts to drop. And then it's going to get to some temperature where it's going to kind of level off again. When, and that temperature is going to be pretty cold. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So you turn the hot water on, heats up. And then it's going to stay hot for some some amount of time. Notice we don't have any labels on here. So however long that is, um, depends on the hot water heater, I'm sure. Um, and then, it, But eventually the hot water is going to run out. It's going to cool off and then it'll level off at a cool temperature. All right. Um, number five, we have a rectangular storage container with an open top. Has a volume of 10 meters cube, 10 cubic meters. The length of the base is twice its width. Um, material for the base costs $10 per square meter. For the sides costs $6 per square meter. Express the cost of materials as a function of the width of the base. Um, okay, so let's see what we have here. So volume is uh, length times width times height. length times width times height. We know that the length is, well, we know the volume is 10. Um, we know the length, and maybe let's draw, we'll draw a little picture here. Um, so the, the length of the base is twice the width, and then we have the height. So um, length is 2w, w is going to stay w, and height is going to stay height. Um, and it doesn't really say anything about the height. So we have 10 equals 2w squared h. We're going to divide both sides by 2w squared. 10 over 2 is 5, so the height can be represented as 5 over w squared. All right. Um, so now what else do we know? So we're expressing the cost. So the cost is going to be um, $10 per square meter on the bottom here. And then $6 per side. Now, you only have one. Uh, so you don't have a lid. So we don't have to pay anything for that part. So we have to pay 10 per square meter on the bottom. And then we have four sides. Um, we have four sides. And those are going to be $6 per square meter um, for each of the sides. So the cost will be... Um, $10 times the area of the base, which would be 2w squared, um, plus 6 for the cost per square meter on the side. We have four sides, and then the, actually, we need to, we need to, because the sides are not all the same. Um, so we have two that are, 2w by h, and we have 2 that are w by h. So uh, let's do 2 times 2wh plus 2 times wh. So this one, this one was the wh side, so the front and the back, and then this one is the, the right side and the left side over here. And so we get, um, well, I need to plug in the 5 over w squared for the h. So and actually, we can make that a 20 w squared. 20 w squared. 
plus uh, 24 wh, we'll go ahead and put in 5 over w squared plus 12 w times 5 over w squared. All right, so that gives us 20 w squared plus 120 w over w squared, so that's 120 over w plus 60 over w. And then combine our like terms, so we get 20 w squared plus 60 and no, plus 180 over w. And that is our cost as a, as a function of width. Um, so this is another, another example that um, there will be a section later, um, probably chapter four, where um, we're, we're working problems like this. And then after you, after you do this part, now the next question would be find the, um, minimize the cost. So we're finding the cost here. We want to minimize the cost for making this box. It has a volume of, well, so that's going to be fixed. The 10 meter, 10 cubic meters is fixed. And um, we want to know what's the least amount of cost we can use spend to create a box that holds 10 cubic meters, that kind of thing. Um, so this will come in handy later, that, that type of example. All right, number six, uh, find the domain of each function. Uh, so this should be things you've seen before. So the square root function, to find the domain of a square root function, whatever is under the square root needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So we're working with real numbers. Um, so we can only take the square root of a positive number. So x is going to be greater than or equal to negative two. So set whatever's under the root, under the radical, um, greater than or equal to zero, and then you solve for x. And so the domain would be bracket negative two up to infinity. All right, uh, the next one is called a rational function. And for a rational function, this part cannot equal zero. So you can never have zero in the denominator. So just set that denominator as not equal to zero. And that will tell you what is not in the domain. So everything else will be in the domain. So let's just solve this. We get x, factor out the x. And we get x is not zero and x is not one. So now the domain um, would be negative infinity to zero parentheses because we're not including the zero union zero to one parentheses because we're not including one and then union one to infinity. So kind of what, what this looks like, you have zero here, you have one here. We're going to put an open circle on these two because we're not including those. Everything else is part of the domain. And so we just have written this in an in, uh, interval notation there. Okay. All right, uh, vertical line test. Sure, we have seen this before as well. A curve in the xy plane is the graph of a function of f if and only if no vertical line intersects the curve more than once. And so we can see uh, this one is a function. No vertical line will touch that curve more than once. But this one, we can see we have vertical lines and it only takes one. Uh, we have vertical lines that cross it more than once. Um, and so the idea here, the reason this is the test is you can see these ordered pairs. They have the same input. So if if the ordered pairs or the ordered pairs have the same input and different outputs. So if you have an input that gives two different outputs, that cannot be a function. So the definition of the function says each input gives exactly one output. And so when you have a vertical line that touches it twice, that means that this whatever this x is has two different outputs. And so that doesn't not that does not work with the definition of a function. All right, um, next we have piecewise functions. And so this is something you, you would see this in algebra and probably more in pre-calculus. Um, something to get used to, you know, you definitely want to want to be comfortable with these. Uh, so f of zero. So this one is defined one minus x if x is less than or equal to one, and then x squared if x is greater than one. And so f of zero zero is less than or equal to one. So we're going to plug it into there. So one minus zero would be one. 
f of 1, 1 is less than or equal to 1. So we'll plug it into there. 1 minus 1 is 0. And then f of 2, 2 is greater than 1. So we'll plug it into there. So 2 squared, which is 4. All right, so now sketch the graph. And uh, again, you can make a table for this, but you, you really shouldn't need to. You want to not have to do that if you can help it. So the first thing I would do, draw kind of the imaginary fence. And so what we're doing, we're drawing this at the one. And so we want to um, graph this part up until the fence. So, uh, now we want to know what is the value at you know, where this is split. And so f of one we found is zero. So, uh, so we'll have the closed circle there because it's equal to one there. And so this has a slope of negative one. So it's going to look something like that x squared, so this one will start. So even though the, val the function does not actually have a value of 1 using this part, we're still going to plug it in. So when you plug in um, 1, you get 1. And But that's not part of the function because it's just greater than. It does The equal part is not there. The equal part is up here. So we're going to put an open circle there. So that's it at one actually that one this one crosses at one so um and then the x squared kind of looks like this and comes up like that all right so you can imagine if if it was the for the whole domain there you'd have that x squared coming up like that but this this part is not part of the graph so we'll erase that um just kind of give you an idea of what where that curve is coming from. It's the x squared curve, but we're not including any of that. That part, that part's gone. So we only have that part that's after one. All right. So that's how you do the, the piecewise. It's not, it's not too difficult. You got to pay attention to where it's split. So one in this case, and then pay attention to where one actually falls. It, it can only follow one piece of it. You can't have you can't have less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to one. So it can only be equal in one part. All right, so let's talk about the absolute value function. Um, the book goes into a little bit of detail on absolute value. I didn't feel the need to, to put that in there. Um, absolute value is measuring the distance from zero um, as a, I guess, rudimentary way to think about it. Um, and so if we're talking about the absolute value of x, we can actually write this um, in a piecewise function. That looked terrible. Let's undo that. Um, so we can actually write this as x and negative x is x if x is greater than or equal to 0, and it's negative x if x is less than 0. And the reason for that, you know the absolute value of 3 is Three. So if x is positive, you're just getting the same number back. If x is negative, then the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. We're getting the negative of that. So negative, negative 3. So if you plug in a negative down here, you're going to get a positive number. So if f of negative 4, you plug in negative 4 there. And negative, negative 4 is going to be positive 4. So if we graph this, um, and you may already know this, the absolute value function looks like a V. So we're going to have X if it's positive. So the X, Y equals X looks like that. Y equals negative X when it's negative looks like that. And so the absolute value function just looks like a V. <clears throat> All right, moving along. Symmetry. Um, symmetry, I'm sure... Again, this is something that would have been covered in algebra, but maybe not in uh, the detail that we're going to go into. Um, it is touched upon, but usually it's pretty simple functions that we're going to get into a little bit. I mean, not super complex, but uh, a little bit more difficult functions to find this. And you can also, um, I usually will teach a little trick. And when I teach college algebra, that you can, you can uh, shortcut this, but... 
we're going to do this the uh, more rigorous way, I guess. So if a function f satisfies f of negative x equals f of x, that's kind of the important part, then f is called an even function. And even functions are symmetric about the y-axis. So for instance, y equals x squared is 1. That is symmetric about the y-axis. And so speaking of y equals x squared, let's just, for example, see if we can prove that that is even. And the way you prove it um, is start with this side, work with your given function, and see if you can get to that side. So f of negative x, so just y equals x squared as an example. So that would be, we're going to plug negative x in for x. So that would be negative x squared. Negative x squared is the same as x squared because anytime you square a number, you get a positive number back. It's always positive. So negative 4 squared is the same as 4 squared. Uh, negative 10 squared is the same as 10 squared and so on. And so this, of course, x squared is equal to our f of x. So we see we have f of negative x equals f of x. Then if a function satisfies f of negative x equals negative f of x, then f is called an odd function. And the graph of an odd function is symmetric about the origin. f of x equals x cubed is an example of this. Um, so let's see if we can prove that one is odd. So f of negative x would be negative x cubed. All right, so if you if you cube a negative number, you get a negative number back. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. So um, this is negative x cubed. And negative x cubed is negative f of x. So that proves that this one is negative. Okay, so those are pretty simple examples. Uh, we're gonna look at some that are slightly more complex, although none of, the, none of these are too bad. Um, it's even odd or neither. Um, so f of x is x to the fifth plus x. So start off with f of negative x, and then you see what you end up with. Because um, we all know if this is even or odd or neither. Um, so let's just see what happens. So if we plug in negative x, we have negative x to the fifth plus negative x. Negative x to the fifth is negative x to the fifth. And then plus the negative x is a minus x. And then we can factor out the negative. And then we get negative f of x. All right, so this one would be odd. 1 minus x to the 4th, so let's start with g of negative x. The 1 is unaffected by that, and then minus uh, negative x to the 4th. And it's important, the, the 4 goes outside the parentheses. That is important. Um, the, the 5 goes outside the parentheses. So you're plugging in whatever that operation is that is being applied to the x. It applies to the whole input. So if you put in... Um, a plus h like we did earlier. A plus h goes in the parentheses. It, the 4 applies to that whole thing. So that, that is going to be very important to make sure that you you are comfortable with it, that you know that's how you do it. Um, parentheses are important, and where you put things in relation to the parentheses is also important. So negative x to the fourth, any, anything raised to a an even power is going to come out positive. So this will just be 1 minus x to the fourth. And then, of course, that is just equal to g of x. So this one is going to be even. All right, and the last one, h of x equals 2x minus x squared. So we have h of negative x. Uh, plug in the negative x. So 2 times negative x minus negative x squared. So we get negative 2x minus negative x squared will give x squared, and then we got the negative that's still out there. Uh, we can factor out a negative, but that doesn't help anything. So we, we're still not, we don't have h of x squared. So this one is neither. All right, so that's how you do that. Um, you got to be, you got to know when you are done. That is that is a very important thing, um, probably throughout the 
the rest of this course, know when you're when when you're done. Um, if you get in this case, you get to the point where you you can try to set, to uh, factor out the negative, but you still aren't there. There's nothing really left to do. So at that point, it's it's not going to be either. So you cannot don't don't try to force this these functions to be even even or odd if they're not. Um, you're just trying to figure out what is, not force it to be one or the other, I guess. All right, uh, last thing, and I don't really have an example for this one, increasing and decreasing functions. So a function f is increasing on an interval. If um, f of x1 is less than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2. In other words, it's moving up from, from left to right. Decreasing, uh, I won't read all that, but moving down from left to right. So this one is increasing from A to B. So A to B, point A to point B. Actually, I guess we should use lowercase. That's that's the X value. So you always, you always state these in terms of X. So uh, increasing from lowercase A to lowercase B is decreasing from B to C. And then it's increasing again from C to D. So we'll put a union there and then C to D. All right, so um, so that's the first section. A lot of this should be review. If, it, if it's not so familiar, then that's something that you would need to practice before you uh, move on to the next sections. Um, make sure you lay a good foundation for this and that will make things a little bit easier. Calculus is difficult though. Um, so the more you practice, the the better you will get, but also um, the, the better your foundation is, the easier it will be later on. All right. Comment if you have any any questions.